Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Just to tell you, I'm going to take a short break from the podcast because I've been working on something and uh, it's quite time consuming. So I'm going to take a short break and I really appreciate all the support everyone's given me, the feedback that's come from it, the new friendships that have been made and it's been a real pleasure. Um, Of course, we remain uh, in a very difficult period and uh, therefore I I wish all of you, your loved ones, your families, safety and security and of course uh, avoidance from this awful COVID-19. Let me start with macro thoughts today because there's been a tremendous spurt of optimism This was on the announcement that Moderna, the company, had reported positive results for a phase one, which is very early stage study of a COVID-19 vaccine. It is up 290% since March. That mRNA COVID-19 vaccine that sent stock markets soaring today was based on only eight human results. And now the company is offering $1.25 billion in stocks at $75 a share. Like an IPO, but not, says Laurie underscore Garrett. Over the weekend, the Federal Reserve's Chairman Powell said medical metrics are the most important data for the US economy now in an interview on CBS. And that goes back to the point that the virus is not correlated to endogenous market dynamics, but is an exogenous uncertainty that remains unresolved and essentially The market, uh, which the Dow Jones jumped 900 points, best day since early April, on coronavirus vaccine hopes, and that was precisely because the market is betting that this exogenous uncertainty is being resolved. Um, I take you back to Druckenmiller, who said, I don't see why anybody would change their behavior because there's a viral drug out there. Um, I said over the weekend, uh, we are in the realms of behavioral economics. Um, Now, the market was up 3%, as company says, positive results on a sample size of 45 that's Sun Chartis. Does anyone read details anymore or do they just inhale cocaine? And I think uh, he said it most pithily of all. So we've got this enormous rebound going on. I don't see it lasting, but of course the nature of rebounds in bear markets are they can be very, very vicious, which is precisely what this one is. Turning to home thoughts, they fancied themselves free, wrote Albert Camus, and no one will ever be free so long as there are pestilences. And his is another way of explaining why the market is so optimistic. Viruses are obviously ancient, perhaps primeval. They are molecular sharks, a motive without a mind. That's Richard Preston. To this day, the natural reservoir of Marburg, another virus is unknown. Marburg lives somewhere in the shadow of Mount Elgon. I like this last Antarctic sunset, sundown at the bottom of the world. No sunshine for four months, temperatures of minus 80. Enjoy the scientific isolation. The 16th crew at Concordia Research Station in Antarctica are spending a full winter at the facility, waving goodbye to the sun as it descends below the horizon not to return for four months. I listened to an interesting interview on Unheard TV, which has been extremely good in seeking out different thought leaders in this space. This was Professor Carol Sikora who said fear is more deadly than the virus. And it's an interesting interview, worth having a listen if you've got the time. Um, Of course, I was writing about the way we live now, and indeed, it is an unusual time. 
I like this photograph of the walking cheetah taken by Torsten Hannevelt uh, via Greatest Tomorrow. What a graceful creature the cheetah is. And then some time ago when we visited Borana, um, Hannah and myself, this was a photograph of nature red in tooth and claw as we watched this cheetah take down an eland. It happened so fast I couldn't take a photograph of that. But I took a photograph of uh, uh, the next few minutes. Never has our future been more unpredictable. Never have we depended so much on political forces that cannot be trusted to follow the rules of common sense and self-interest, forces that look like sheer insanity if judged by the standards of other centuries. That's Hannah Arendt. Um, and uh, that's true, isn't it? I like this photograph, Western Skies Motel, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 1977, by Ernst Haas, via Fedel Italiano, 76. The Amphan cyclone is upgraded to a super cyclone at 270 kilometers per hour. According to experts, it is now the strongest cyclone ever recorded in the Bay of Bengal, passing the 1999 Odisha cyclone. That's via Parveen Kaswan, and it certainly feels like a decade of semiotic arousal when everything, it seemed, was a sign, a harbinger of some future radical disjuncture or cataclysmic upheaval. Total COVID-19 cases worldwide, 4.76 million. Total COVID-19 deaths worldwide, 314,391. Total recoveries worldwide, 1.72 million. <clears throat> On the 10th of May, I was writing about the spillover moment, and uh, that's seen in uh, Stephen Streeter's tweet, Global cases rising steadily as Brazil overtakes the United Kingdom. Global R value sits just above 1. Uh, places growing at faster than 10%. Cameroon, Sudan, Tajikistan, fa faster than 5%. Brazil, Bangladesh, South Africa, Kuwait, Afghanistan, Armenia, Bolivia, Guatemala, Gabon and Kyrgyzstan. And that's the spillover I was describing because the first impact of was China, then US and Europe. Very interesting essay in The Atlantic by Tom McTagg. The pandemic's coming geopolitical second wave. With most European countries confident that they are past the worst of the coronavirus pandemic, their attention is turning to the chance of its resurgence once society returns to some semblance of normal. What that normal will be is a different matter. Beyond the epidemiological challenges lies a slowly amassing threat that is not pathological in nature, but economic, political and military. This is the geopolitical second wave and its power is already starting to concern Western leaders. Somewhere a state defaults on debt held largely by Western financial institutions. In the chaos an autocrat eyes an opportunity for a land grab. A United States already unwilling to take the lead leaves China to step into the void. Of those I spoke with, few doubted that a second wave was coming. The real concern was where it would land. History, as Barack Obama said of American progress, zigs and zags. Great changes set off chain reactions. Each event creates political aftershocks and trends that we can clearly see only afterwards. 
Historians love chapter breaks, said Robert Kaplan, an American foreign policy expert and former member of the U.S. Defense Policy Board, who this month briefed officials at 10 Downing Street on the potential second-order effects of the coronavirus crisis. COVID-19 will come to be seen as a chapter break. Michael Clark, um, a defense studies professor at King's College London, told me that an economically weakened Russia hit by the recent collapse in oil prices poses a greater danger to Western security interests. Putin's aggressive opportunism will probably get worse, Clark said. The nature of Putin's leadership is that he can't stand still. He has to keep pushing forward. This makes him more volatile. Crises, Kaplan noted, put history on fast forward. Clark is particularly concerned about an arc of instability from West Africa through the Middle East to Asia, where conflict and instability have in recent years forced people to flee. That's why I said in one of my articles, regime implosion risk is trending higher. Karin von Hippel, the Director General of the Royal United Services Institute, told me that some kind of reckoning with China is likely as well. Some countries will emerge from this trying to cling to China, but most others are likely to try to decouple, she said, for Britain, Germany, France, and other major European economies, reliant on the American security umbrella, but wanting to maintain strong economic ties with China. The difficulty of managing the fallout from the Trump administration's anti-China rhetoric may now only increase. Inside Downing Street, concern about COVID-19's geopolitical second wave is real, with work underway to understand the potential threats and prepare for them. Whether the pandemic brings about revolutionary change or simply accelerates the currents already working under the surface, The fact is that the epidemiological second wave isn't the only one we need to worry about. I thought that was a great essay. Um, I was speaking about the viral moment and its arrival in February, quoting Gladwell, the tipping point in an epidemic when a virus reaches critical mass. It's the boiling point, it's the moment on the graph when the line starts to shoot straight upwards. 7th of October 2019, I was saying the world in the 21st century exhibits viral wildfire and exponential characteristics and feedback loops, which only become evident in hindsight. And I think that's the point that was also being made. More recently, I was saying, as I try and peer through into the future, the one thing I do know is that it's not reverting to what it was. We are turning the page here. Previously, I was writing about the zeitgeist of a time as its defining spirit or its mood, and capturing the zeitgeist of the now is not an easy thing because we're living in a dizzyingly fluid moment. I take you back to comments made by Navarro, Chinese behind the shield of WHO for two months hid the virus from the world and then sent hundreds of thousands of Chinese on aircraft to Milan, New York and around the world to seed that. That is an act of war, if you think about it. And in October 2018, when... um, Tensions were very high as well. I was saying war is coming. Very interesting interview with David Starkey. COVID-19, Britain's disastrous response will have devastating consequences. Worth having a listen. I like this short clip via Manuel Voss. This guy, Bill Gates, knows more than any scientist. 1st of March, I was quoting William Burroughs, a paranoid is someone who knows a little of what's going on. To wit, look at this from uh, somebody I follow on social media, Yu 15 And actually, social media has been an incredible resource to look more deeply into a lot of the things that have been happening. And this is one example of that. 
Here is a huge list of coronaviruses with identical or nearly identical sequences at the critical S1, S2 and S2 locations. But only COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 has a pathogenic PRRAR polybasic cleavage site. Why? That's Lawrence Selin. I think Chinese scientists artificially inserted it there, indeed. Before engineering a furin site that does not exist in any beta coronaviruses of lineage B, not even tolerated in wild animals for spike genes that is more than 40% homologous to that of SARS-CoV-2, that's DIU15 again. Let's move on to the markets. The dollar index came off the 100 mark, was last at 99.437 and is very correlated to optimism and pessimism. The dollar gets stronger if people are more pessimistic and we got a burst of optimism, so got sold off. Euro dollar 109.41 and caught a lot of people who thought it was breaking down by now. Cathay Pacific carried an average of just 458 passengers per day in April and only expects 500 in May, which is a 99.6% drop from the same month last year. That's why Lizanne Saunders, and that's why we need to be a little bit careful about all this optimism that's come uh, with the bungee jump in the crude oil market, which I'll get to in a moment. As I said, we're in the realms of behavioral economics. This is the way we live now. SoftBank's Maya Yoshi Son said, even Jesus Christ was also misunderstood. Whenever anybody says that, you know they're in deep trouble. Um, last year, September 2019, before this virus hit, I was uh, put out a conviction buy on Netflix at the closing price of 270.75. In that article I was saying my mind went back to an article I read in 2012, Annals of Technology Streaming Dreams by John Seabrook. People went from broad to narrow and we think they will continue to go that way, spend more and more time in the niches because now the distribution landscape allows for more narrowness. And I was saying Netflix is not a US business, it's a global business. The majority of analysts are in the US and in my opinion these same analysts have an international blind spot. Once investors appreciate that the story is an international one and not a US one anymore, we will see the price ramp to fresh all-time highs. Indeed, we have. Netflix is now at 452.58. Commodity markets gold, a little bit soft, 1730 because, of course, of all this optimism. But I remain very bullish um, and for good reasons. Uh, WTI crude oil, wow, what a bungee jump, currently trading around $32. And um, if you've been brave enough to buy it that day when it went negative, this contract, which is now at $32, was around, if I remember the lowest it got to, was about 10 I think. Emerging markets, Brazil is now the world's fastest growing coronavirus hotspot, accounting for 13% of all new cases globally in the past week. Just days after it overtook Italy and Spain in total number of cases, the Latin American nation claimed the number three spot from the United Kingdom, reporting 254,220 confirmed cases as of Monday. A quickly deteriorating political crisis and infighting among federal and state officials as well as in President Bolsonaro's own cabinet leave the nation without a comprehensive strategy to slow the spread. Social distancing measures vary from state to state, even city to city as local leaders take charge of implementing their own quarantines and lockdowns. Three health ministers in less than a month, fewer than 3,500 tests per million. No clear federal guidance on how to deal with the pandemic and varied uncoordinated containment policies. 
that's an emerging market strategist from UBS. It's no surprise that Brazil is a new epicenter, he added. Emerging markets now account for the five fastest growing coronavirus hotspots. That's the spillover risk I was talking about, with Brazil leading the pack, followed by India and Saudi Arabia. Daily new cases grew 5.5% on average in the past week to 241,080 infections as of Sunday. That compares with the growth rate of 4.1% in Russia. In the US, um, the growth rate is now 1.6%. Acting Minister Eduardo Pazuelo, who is a military general and not a doctor, is expected to expand the use of chloroquine to treat COVID-19 patients, the key demand from the president that prompted his previous health minister, Tish's departure. On average, more than one in 10 new infections worldwide can now be traced to the country, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. And in a typical example of cause and effect, the uh, Ibovespa equity index has posted the world's biggest drop this year with a 51% decline in dollar terms. The real is also the worst performer among major currencies, losing about a third of its value. 10th of May, I was talking about the spillover moment. I said Brazil is the global epicenter of the coronavirus, and I was describing a spillover into EM and frontier geographies. I said in Brazil, we have a toxic mix of a voodoo President Bolsonaro and a, and a runaway COVID-19. You remember, he said, Brazilians aren't infected by anything, even when they fall into a sewer. It's tragic surrealism. I can't stop thinking about Gabriel Garcia Marquez when I think about the situation Manaus is facing. So accounting for 13% of all new cases globally in the past week. Let's move on to Africa. 54 African Union member states reporting 84,872 cases, 2,771 deaths. 32,646 recoveries. That's from Africa CDC. Have a look at the case fatality rate and the difference between North and South Africa. It's very dramatic and it's a demographic thing. 22nd of March, I was talking about this being a perfect storm. Buckle up and let's stop popping the quaaludes. And a lot of quaaludes being popped. A lot of people want to believe the Madagascar president's onto something. A lot of other people want to believe our numbers are somehow, this thing's going to go away like a miracle for various reasons. Some of them are valid, but, you know, uh, it's extremely naive to believe that. So COVID-19 and the spillover moment, trajectories of per capita deaths. This is from Our World in Data. As I said, the worrying development is transmission hotspots. Kano in Nigeria, for example, Western Cape is growing at an alarming rate. Um, it's impossible to secure a hospital bed in Tanzania. Aga Khan Hospital in Dar es Salaam had a well-equipped ward for 80 coronavirus patients, but several were dying each night. That was a report by David Pilling. And I was asking, you know, the question for Sub-Saharan Africa is whether these transmission hotspots expand and conflate. 22 new deaths and 918 new cases in South Africa yesterday. Total number of cases is up by 6%. Um, uh, daily positivity rate is 6.5%. That's the highest rate since lockdown began. 61 cases are from the Western Cape, which is a transmission hotspot. Major news, South Sudan's Vice President Rik Machar, plus his wife, Defence Minister Angelina Tenney, plus guards and staff reportedly test positive for COVID-19, which some reports suggest is sweeping through Juba's political elite. That's from Alan Boswell. Um, I agree with this comment from uh, Quilch TM. All these folks saying, what if Magafuli is right, need to read about Tabo and Becky and HIV AIDS. I said that the African Jair Bolsonaro is, of course, President Magafuli. 
And President Magafuli said prayers have succeeded in reducing the number of COVID-19 cases in the country, despite the American embassy recently warning that all evidence points to exponential growth of the epidemic. There are no current figures because they haven't released any data for about two weeks. Um, God has answered our prayers and he should be praised for listening to us, Magafuli said at a church service broadcast live from Chateau Town in the Gator region of northwestern Tanzania. Um, he said charter flights are fully booked with tourists lining up to come to Tanzania because it's safe. He said he had ordered the Minister for Wildlife and Tourism not to put the tourists in quarantine and to let them into the country if their temperature is found to be normal. Um, earlier said that other countries in the WHO are overreacting to the disease. He said on Sunday that his son had contracted the virus and was healed at home by just drinking ginger and lemons and now he's doing press-ups. He said Tanzania's economy is the first priority and the country should not agree to be ruled by the disease. Um, during the 1970s, the virus fell like a shadow. This is HIV AIDS over the human population living along the east-west highway that links Kinshasa in Zaire. And that's a photograph I took actually from the air recently um, with Mombasa in Kenya. Uh, and now we learn 53 truck drivers, 51 of whom were Tanzanians, were denied entry to Kenya after testing positive for coronavirus, and this is the point, um, uh, lorry drivers and that highway has got history. Uh, why anthropologists, the example they give is advice on adaption of burial rites matters a lot in the Eastern Cape funerals have been a source of community transmission, even in remote areas. A Cameroon pastor who claimed he could cure COVID-19 has died from the virus now hundreds of his supporters are panicking after he laid hands on them in an effort to cure them of the infection. Um, there is something karmic in this COVID-19. Monitoring the impact of COVID-19 on firms in Ethiopia, headline findings from a World Bank phone survey by Richard Humphreys, 37% of firms in Addis Ababa earned no revenue in the last month. Micro firms were particularly hard hit with 41% having zero revenues. This is something that I was predicting in an article 2nd of March, COVID-19, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the R for recession word. South African all shares minus 9.99%. Dollar Rand, the Rand is firmed with this optimism, 18.27. Egyptian pound, 15.78. EGX 30, minus 26.38%. Almost half of the world's LNG vessels currently deemed floating storage are laden with Nigerian gas, according to commodity tracking firm Kipler. That's from Andrew Ali. Nigerian all shares minus 10.55% year-to-date. Ghana Stock Exchange is minus 11.36% year-to-date. In the past 24 hours, we've sampled 1,139 uh, for coronavirus, 25 tested positive. That's Kenya. Linda uh, Ogutu to asking, is there a diplomatic war between Kenya and Tanzania? Because Tanzania has now closed the border. Increasing reports of locusts hatching in Turkana, Marsabit and Samburu counties. That's from FAO Locust. We're on high alert given the recent floods that there could be more undocumented sites. The race is on. This is the locust menace, which I wrote about in the Africa Report in an article called Debt, Virus and Locusts Create a Perfect Storm for Africa. Came across a gentleman who's doing charts on an Elliott Wave basis. Have a look at his chart for Equity Bank. Uh, closing price 35.50, trailing PE 5.98. Another one for Diamond Trust as well. This is M. Nandy. Um, uh, Diamond Trust is trading on a PE of 3.173. Kenya shilling at 106.50. Nairobi all share minus 16.3%. NSE 20 minus 24.88%. And once again, farewell for a little time. 
and uh, normal service will be resumed once I finish the book. Thank you for being of such a great audience, and I really have appreciated it tremendously.